Well, the dedicated no folks that were here. Um, so what I'm just going to do is provide a brief update on the evaluation of where we're at now, uh, an uh, overview of the toolkit, which you hopefully received in the little bag that uh, Sophia probably gave to you when you checked in. And if you don't have a copy, we've got some extra ones and it's also available online. And I will be sending the link out to that online version in Slack probably tomorrow, maybe today if I can remember. Um, and then lastly, uh, I will briefly touch upon and just give some brief overview of the focus groups that will be taking place immediately after this and uh, what that is and why your involvement is important. Um, so for the evaluation, just as a high level review, um, there are three objectives in the original USDA grant for the RFSP project. And I'm not gonna read them verbatim. There's, and they're both kind of, you know, boring grant speak, but uh, as an overview, objectives one and two, focus on increasing sales of food from small and mid-sized growers. And uh, in early 2022, we'll start to touch upon as a, as a group, how and, and what we're gonna do to collect the dollars for those two objectives and how we're gonna measure the progress through time. So in 2022, start looking out for that information and how you'll be able to contribute to that. And we'll have to make decisions about like anonymity for farmer sales and all that kind of thing, but we'll worry about that later. Um, objective three is, is more esoteric and it basically talks about improving the stability and capacity of partners with the development of shared resources, tools, and knowledge, whatever those things mean, which I'll talk about a little bit later because that's what the focus groups will be focusing on. Uh, the UNM Evaluation Lab, the leader of which Melissa Binder is back here, um, they are spearheading uh, objective three for the work, uh, which will be starting today. Yes. Uh, well, objectives one and two, I just summarized, they're both focused on sales, increased sales of food. And I can read it to you verbatim. If you have the toolkit, it is on. on. Uh, page six. Your details. Sorry, I have a room that didn't get one of those toolkits in a bag yet. Sophia, do you? Um, I I know there's one out there. It's blank. Okay. And there's the other ones are all over the other uh, that yeah. area. Yeah, there's some extras there too, and it is also online, and I'll I'll okay. share that link uh, in Slack later. Uh, so right now, in terms of evaluation, we're in the process of getting. Sorry, that's okay. Of getting the data management plan um, consent to by the work teams and. Uh, work, one work team has consented to it. Another work team is kind of in the process. We, we've met and discussed it and uh, they have yet to vote on it or consent. And then the third work team hasn't done anything. But I'm hoping that since we've had this wonderful retreat and everyone's like geared up, that uh, approval of the data management plan will be uh, forthcoming before the end of the year. And if I see a few quizzical looks and in Slack, I will also provide the link to the data management plan. If you scroll through the all partners, you'll find it, but just to make your lives easier, I can do that. If you have any questions about that, you can definitely ask me. And, uh, but right now we're basically at the beginning of establishing baselines uh, for those three main objectives. Uh, so we can have something to measure off of and measure our progress over the next three years and hopefully beyond. Um, but I also want to point out that uh, partners can also 
uh, have questions that are not covered in those three main objectives. Uh, things that they want to investigate uh, further or more in depth or in a different direction than those three main objectives. And with that, I'll move on to discussing the toolkit that you receive. Now this document um, was created to empower all the partners uh, to conduct additional research uh, for the project. Um, but I also wrote it in a way that would allow partners to conduct just independent research on different topics for their own organizations or businesses. Um, and I, there is a process that if you want to add objectives to this project, chapter one talks about that. Like if you want to hone in or look at something specific to this project, there's a process, it's just six steps that you can go through to add objectives to this RFSP initiative. And it follows in the spirit of collective impact. So everyone kind of has a say, everyone will be, have a chance to, you know, ask you about the research that you're interested in doing and you know you can have clarifying questions and all that but it's you know listen to chapter one if you have any questions about it let me know i i kind of like people to read things first and have a chance to ruminate on it um and you can ask me questions at any any time the the toolkit focuses on a, a type of research called community-based research and it increases uh, the research capacity of individual organizations and businesses because you're involving community members in the work. So with training and mentorship, you can have a much larger pool of people to assist with research projects. Um, the involvement that occurs in community-based research, it, it occurs on a continuum. So at one end, you would you know, inform your community and your community can be anything you want. It could be neighbors on a block, it could be customers, it could be a specific age group, whatever you want to define your community as. So on one end, you would just say, hey, we're doing this research. I'm just letting you know. On the other end of the continuum, the, the community would be involved in all stages of the research. They would help develop the research questions. They would help plan the research. They would help collect the data. They would help analyze the data, publish it, get the word out. So it's two extremes. And you know, both have their advantages and disadvantages. But you know, generally, when people do community-based research, it, it falls somewhere in between for a variety of reasons. And one of the, the biggest determinants on where you may want your research to fall on a continuum is time. And the less time you have, the more difficult it is to involve community members just because it takes a lot of time to reach out, you know, let people know what you're doing, um, talk to people, make those connections, increase trust, provide training. So it's a great tool, but it, it does take time. Uh, so allow yourself that time and it's okay. You know, it's better to take it more slowly and get good results, good community involvement than to speed it up and just have something that's disorganized and no one's really happy with it. Um, but I do want to point out something really important is that this toolkit is was written to provide a broad outline. So there's a lot of information in it, but it's all... Um, I wouldn't say at surface level, but with, with each section, you could write a whole new toolkit about each thing that's written. So I talk about focus groups in a couple paragraphs. You know, that's like a whole, whole, whole expertise that you go down that rabbit hole. You know, I, I provide tips on writing survey questions, but you could write a whole toolkit on writing survey questions. So look at it through that lens, but I think there's enough information to allow partners to feel empowered that they can start moving forward, but with the understanding that once they decide they want to do something, you may want to do more a deeper investigation 
and different tools or uh, processes just to get more comfortable. I think. Yeah. Are there, I forget, are there links and things built into the digital version if people want more information or is there an appendix for that? There's, there's both. Yeah, and the <laughs> appendix, um, in appendix B, there is a pretty, you know, there's a little overview on where you can go to get more information about community-based research, where you can get more information about ethics and uh, DEI and research, where you can get more information on research skill building. And in the digital version, those links are live. So it makes it easier. But they're also in this version if you want to come up. And there's, there's many others as well. You're welcome. And the digital version is definitely on Slack and it's in Thrive. I will be posting the link to the digital version later okay. in Slack. Okay, and then I'll put it into the November retreat drive. So everything from the retreat will be in the drive. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So when you're when you're looking at the toolkit, I think it's important to point out several things. One is that research is a process. And if you follow the process step by step in kind of a logical, snail like fashion with patience and persistence, you know, you will get valuable information. You know, but it's that process that is important and being able to pay attention to details and just follow in a systematic fashion. Um, but when you're actually collecting the data, especially when you're doing interviews, it's really important to, to remove your own bias when you're talking to other people, when you're looking at survey questions or anything like that, as much as humans can, right? That what you wanna to try to do is put yourself in a position like you're a, a child looking at something for the very first time and kind of pretend you know nothing and look at it just with this, you know, a, a wonder and awe like kids do, you know, they're learning about something new and it's all exciting and new. And that's the kind of how you want to approach research when you're collecting the data, because then, you know, your own viewpoints, you know, you, they won't be a factor. You're trying to really learn new things, you know, sweep in as much new information, unexpected that you can. And one of the best ways to do that is just, you know, kind of temporarily divorce yourself from your own beliefs, your own views, and what you think is right, even if you know what's right. <laughs> You know, just leave that door open for that. And the ability to do that, you can't learn it from a book. I mean, no one can really teach you how to do that. It really, it's just a feeling. You know, it comes from your heart, comes from your head too. But, you know, I know PhDs that I would never want to have conduct interviews. And I know people, one person in particular, you know, she works at a gas station. She's got a GED. I would have her do an interview over you know, some friends of mine who are, are professors. So, and there's great, you know, so it, it doesn't necessarily depend upon your education level, whether or not you can conduct a good interview with someone. What is a determinative good interview is be able to just pretend you don't know anything, you know, that blank slate, like you're a baby. That's kind of how I think about it. And just allow yourself to learn new things when it comes to the analysis, though, you know, that is a process that it is important to involve someone in the analysis phase who has, has done that type of analysis before, because there are tips and tricks and, and methods to use that makes data analysis successful. So you learn as much as possible. So that those are my views on uh, things to keep in mind, you know, when you're looking at the at the toolkit and deciding what kind of research you want to do for yourself in your own organizations or within the confines of this project. So I kind of rushed through that just because we started a little late. We actually have focus groups that are coming up. Um, but before I talk about that, I wanted to see if there was any questions about anything I just blew through. And if you want to take time later to review the toolkit and then ask questions and approach me, that's totally fine. 
So the next part of the evaluation are, do you have a question? Oh, no. Oh, okay. I got it. No. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Yeah. Is uh, focus groups. And the focus groups are to help measure uh, objective three, which focuses on improving stability and capacity of partners to the development of shared resources, tools, and knowledge. Uh, the goal is the focus group is to help us to find what operational capacity means. You know, what does knowledge mean? What do, what are tools and resources? How are we defining that for this objective within this project? What does stability mean? So before we can measure objective three and get a baseline, we have to have a shared um, um, vocabulary about what we're talking about when we talk about operation capacity or knowledge. So the goal of the focus group is to provide definitions for those things. And then from that, a baseline survey will be sent out near the end of the year or beginning of next year. And we'll get that baseline. And then that same survey will be used throughout the duration of the project to see change through time as it relates to objective. So when you're in the focus groups, keep a couple things in mind. One, just think about your own views, your own experiences, and you know, your own definitions of these things and how they relate to you and any of the other questions that are asked in the focus group. Um, just think about yourself and what you feel is true for you. And also there are, you know, there's no right or wrong answers to any of this. Um, We'll just collect all the data from the partners who participate. And we also have a, a Zoom focus group that will take place. So people who are not able to be here now can also take part in this. Um, and then we'll, the UNM Evaluation Lab, the two grad students who, uh, there's one, <laughs> this is Arlo and this is Brisa. Uh, they're with the UNM Evaluation Lab and they will be conducting the focus groups. Uh, so what we would like you to do is they're gonna you're gonna split up into two groups. Half of you will go with Arlo, and half of you will go with Brisa. And the co-facilitators for these groups, Arlo will be co-facilitating with Elga, and then Brisa will be co-facilitating with Ophelia. So what I would like you to do now is to get up and kind of line yourselves up next to each of them, just even even amount, split yourselves in half. Huh? Oh, Brisa staying here. So half of you can stay here, and then half of you can follow Arlo across the hall, um, where we have the DEI training. 